if you can go ahead and find your seat, we'll go ahead and we'll get started for the evening. I'm Deb Smith, I'm Executive Director of the Library. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I hope that everybody has gotten our rack card, which has the list of all the lectures in our series this year. We have some wonderful lectures coming up. And tonight we have a wonderful group here. And I'm actually going to ask Chan Light, who is president of the Board of Trustees for the Library, to do the honor of the introductions tonight. But it's wonderful to see you all here. Welcome to the Jones. <laughs> Welcome, and as, as Deb said, I have the, the privilege to serve as the uh, president of the board of directors, board of trustees of the library. And one of our most pleasurable activities is to have guests like yourself here and to share local history uh, with you. So thank you for coming out. Uh, no matter how well you think you know Lynchburg history, you always learn something here that you weren't aware of previously. Uh, and uh, a disclaimer, I am a member, my wife and I are members of Boonesboro, so I've got an ax to grind uh, on their behalf. But uh, I think you'll hear some things this evening, whether you're a member or not, that is, are really saying, hmm, I didn't know that. Uh, so anyway, hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll leave here thinking this was a good, a good way to spend your, your uh, late afternoon. And with that, what I'd like to do uh, is introduce our three speakers this evening. I'm going to do them in the order uh, that I understand they're going to speak in. And the first speaker uh, is Alex Owen, who many of you all know. He grew up here in Lynchburg and was away for a while and then came back a number of years ago. He and I were classmates at VES together, so it was always nice to welcome him back to town. And very, very uh, uh, nicely, he is a nephew of the namesake of this program, of John Owen. Uh, the you know the famous architect. So it's sort of like everything has come full circle with Alex. Uh, and then our second speaker is going to be Dr. Rick Bendall, who a number of you know. Uh, and I don't want to steal his thunder, but he's going to have some great stories about golf. Uh, and then and I've got people. Yeah. And then Dan Bradway, who is a relative newcomer to Boonesboro. He joined us from a club in in uh, Delaware about four years ago. Uh, Dan, uh, and we're lucky to have him. He really has brought a lot of new energy to the club, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, some other aspects that Alex and, and Rick have not covered. So with that said, you're here to hear these three gentlemen and not me, but again, thank you for being here, and with that, Alex, can you come to the, sure. to the microphone, please? Chan, you opened this can of worms. Um, Chan and I did go to, to uh, high school together. We went back for a union uh, a couple of years ago and uh, we bumped into a professor and he said, oh yes, Chan, you were an excellent student. You were a very, very good student. And he looked at me and said, and you were a student also, weren't you? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, that, that sort of had started. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. Um, we're in the midst of our 100th centennial anniversary and uh, we're, we've been having an awful lot of fun with it and as we got into it we started to look at uh, the history of the club and what we knew and what we didn't know and uh, and compiled a history of the club we put some of it out on the internet you can look for it uh, easiest way to find things about Boonesboro is to go to YouTube and type in Boonesboro Country Club a bunch of things will pop up including videos Wayne Johnson did a wonderful video for us uh, during the summer uh, that's, that really is terrific, and I think uh, everyone would enjoy it. Uh, tonight, we're going to walk through some of that material and a lot of other things that we've never presented before. So let's get started. Uh, in the 1700s, if you look at Lynchburg, and I need, I need now our laser pointer, which I, I put right here. If I can get it out and use it properly. And uh, there, there's a good guy. So Lynchburg in the 1700s was just down here. Um, Nicholas Davies was a Welshman who moved to, the, to, the, uh, to Virginia in the early 1700s, made a lot of money working for Mr. Jefferson's father and uncle. Uh, moved to Lynchburg when George III granted him 33,000 acres. I didn't have a good feel for what that was, so I did some math. It's 51 square miles of land. It stretched from what was Cabell Street, where Point of Honor is, over to Poplar Forest and west towards Glasgow. And if you read a little further down, you find that the king, just for good measure, gave Thomas Jefferson uh, another 25,000 acres just east of Lexington. 
Uh, Thomas Jefferson sold it off. But a lot of this was how people in this era became wealthy. They did something for the king. Nicholas Davies was a colonel in the army, in the British Army, uh, French and Indian Wars. I don't know exactly what he did, but as a colonel, he would have been only lower than a general in the army. Uh, led them into battle. For whatever reason, King George III, he was a little nuts. Um, uh, led uh, led him to battle. King George III gave him 33,000 acres, making him far and away the wealthiest person in the area at the time. Uh, when you look at this, you realize that, that Mr. Davies owned Boonesboro, he owned Bedford Hills, uh, he owned Wigington, he owned Brentcorn, he had Riverside, Riverside Park, all the way down uh, to Blackwater Creek. Uh, it, it's absolutely staggering amount of land he owned. And he looked at Eagle Larry as, his, as the primary area, uh, as the center of his empire, if you will. Uh, a little different map, but the same idea. In the 20s, I started thinking, well, why is Boonesboro out in the country? Uh, why would you build out in the country? Well, everything was out in the country. Uh, in 1908, the, the city of Lynchburg had crossed, here's Blackwater Creek coming around, had crossed the river in 1908 to about here. Um, if you think of St. Mary Methodist Church, it was about the property line in 1908. The next annexation was 1926, which brought us out to Bedford County. This roughly follows, this would be Lake Road following through here. Uh, but that means that, wait a minute, Oakwood Club was built in the county. Baptist Hospital was built in the county. VES was built in the county. Um, Randolph-Macon College was built in the county. None of them were built in the city of Lynchburg. They were annexed into the city, in some cases, 10 years later. Uh, so in the case of Randolph-Macon, 25 years later, because it dates from the 1890s. Uh, most of the things were built out in the county. If you look at the roads, and you know, just for fun, I was thinking about the trolley line that ran, up, ran through uh, Rivermont Avenue and, and out to Oakwood Place. Uh, about, it stopped running in 1938. Most of the road on either side of the tracks was not paved. And the big argument in the 1930s during the Depression was, who's going to pay to pave it? Um, the reason that they paved over it is the federal government during the Works Progress decided that they would pay to pave roads to keep people busy. They weren't going to pave roads that had trolley lines on them. The city of Lynchburg in their infinite wisdom said, well, we're going to pay for it. That's one thing, but you're going to pay for it. We'll just pay it over the tracks. And that's what they did. Um, so as you, as you look at, uh, look at the, the growth of Lynchburg, of course, today, uh, in 1976, we annexed out uh, all the way to Coffee Road, and now Winsboro is almost in the city. I think the era of annexation may be about over. But uh, as a practical matter, the city has come out to us. We are where Oakwood was 80 years ago. Just interesting anecdotes. Mr. Davies built a house. Uh, Kent Van Allen lives in the house today, if you know Kent. Uh, the house was built in 1785. Beautiful home sits off the Hockin Rock Road called Pebbles. Uh, it looks like a big house now, but if you can only imagine what that house would have looked like to someone coming up to it in 1785, a monstrous mansion. It's important to, to think about Mr. Davies, actually his son gave the land. It was his land, but his son, he died in 17, uh, 1793. In 1794, his actual granddaughter, Mary Frances Merriweather. Frances Merriweather was the first cousin of Merriweather Lewis. Uh, don't have to explain to people in Lynchburg how people use names. Uh, they name their child after their spouse's mother's name. And we recycle names. So the Lewises and the Merriweathers intermarried. Um, Mrs. Merriweather used her name for her son and called him Merriweather Lewis, uh, of Lewis and Clark fame. This is not a great picture, but in 1798, the home that Francis Merriweather and his wife Catherine Davies built became, was the home that would later become Boonesboro Country Club. Uh, they use a lot of local materials, but they imported hardware and tile and glass from England because they're really hard to come by in Virginia, especially as far west as 
Lynchburg was in the 1790s. Uh, just hard to do. Much of the land was sold off. They started with a thousand, he was given a thousand and twenty-eight acres by the Davies family. And because in an agricultural society, land was wealth, uh, if you couldn't make the land produce money, and the Mayor Brothers and the Davies were not able to do that effectively, uh, you sold the land off bit by bit, and you watched your wealth. Your wealth grow, but your land holdings decrease. Uh, that's no longer the case today, but, but really, you would measure people by how much land they owned. And if you go back far enough, you remember that only landowners used to get to vote. Uh, because you had the only vested economic interest in the area. Uh, we're very fortunate at the club. We have a, a fair amount of the, of the uh, Merriweather family and the Tinsley Rucker family. Uh, John Tinsley Rucker uh, is a descendant of the Merriweathers, and the land was deeded to them uh, in the late 1800s. Actually, I think it was in 1910. I wrote that, so it's my fault. But uh, uh, in 1910, the, the family deed the property with John Tinsley Rucker, and they farmed it for about 10 or 12 years and came to the conclusion that they couldn't make money on this farm uh, for longer for long money. Uh, and it was time to sell the farm. Uh, this is a picture taken in the 1880s of members of the family. Some of the names are on the back. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, in our library up on the second floor, uh, all of these uh, artifacts are laid out with a fair number of other pictures uh, of members of the of the Merriweather and Davies family, uh, and some of the Rucker family. That's fascinating to look at, family biography as well. Uh, as we transition, uh, if you think about what was happening in Lynchburg, uh, it's kind of odd for Boonesburg to put up a picture of Oakwood Country Club, but if you think about what was happening in Lynchburg in the late 1890s and early 1900s, Lynchburg Foundry, we talked about VES and Randolph Macon, the Baptist Hospital. Um, but Craddock Terry was founded in the late 18, in the eight, early 1890s. Uh, the foundry was renamed the foundry in 1902. Uh, there were 41 uh, tobacco manufacturers in Lynchburg at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, Lynchburg was a really prosperous town. Uh, I think I read that only Bridgeport, Connecticut was wealthier than Lynchburg in 1900. Uh, that's not to say that the wealth was evenly distributed, but it was a very wealthy town. And as, as we came up on, uh, on World War I, the wealth led to people looking for other things to do. Uh, there was a piece of land out, of the, out past the edge of town that was called the Lynchburg Gun Club, uh, where wealthy people could go and shoot guns right next to the city. Uh, always a good idea. And, um, and it was purchased uh, in 1913 and turned into Oakwood Country Club in 1914. Uh, Oakwood was the was the first country club in the area, and the first golf course in the area. Uh, golf had really taken off in the 1870s, 1880s in the U.S. Of course, it had caught on the team much earlier. But as it came to Lynchburg, this was our first shot at a golf course. And um, while it was a great first effort, it was rather short. It was not a pro-length course, especially by today's measures. And it was very hilly. If you've ever played golf, have ever played golf in Oakwood, or have even walked the area, or driven in that where the homes are, you walk straight up, and you walk straight down, <laughs> and straight up. It's a very hilly course. And a lot of the really good golfers in the city didn't like that. Uh, they didn't feel that it represented them well. They looked at other courses in, in Richmond and in other areas in Virginia that had recently been built, and they thought they wanted better and that they could do better. Uh, and to that end, um, in 1922, uh, five folks who got together uh, commissioned Mr. Willie Parks to uh, come to the United States and make recommendations not to build Boonesburg Country Club, but to make Oakwood a better course. Uh, he was not brought here to, to do something new. Uh, unfortunately for Oakwood and, and for a lot of folks, when he got to the course and looked at it, he said, the growth along Link Road and, and other areas have fenced you in. There's nothing I can do with this place. Um, and so he recommended looking for other land. It was coincidental and, and a wonderful happenstance that the uh, Tinsley Rucker Farm came up for sale in 1922. 
Not very many people wanted to be farmers in that era. There was not a whole lot of use for the land. It was not in the city or even adjacent to the city by the practical means. It was cart paths to get out to it. Uh, it was not going to sell for a ton of money. It was probably going to be broken up into subdivisions for later use. Uh, Mr. Parks was showing the site and he liked the site. And, uh, and he said this would make an excellent golf course. And, uh, and he recommended buying the course, and he actually went on to lay the course out. Do you want to kick in? You know Mr. Parks better than I've ever been. Well, he was uh, uh, from Musselburgh, Scotland. And of course, all, at that period of time, all the Scottish pros, and he was a pro when the British opened twice, were uh, immigrating to the United States, to various places, usually up and down the East Coast, to uh, stimulate golf and build courses and uh, get everything going. Uh, he was uh, famous in the British Isles for his course designs and that kind of business. And um, unfortunately, he came over here and uh, routed the course, which really means you get the direction of the tees and the holes and the green set. Uh, and he got ill. We don't know exactly what was wrong with it, but he had to go back uh, in 1923 to Scotland and died soon after that. Mm -hmm. so, so Willie Parks laid out the golf course and um, never got to finish it. And if, if you think about it, you know, today golf courses, you design it, you get out the bulldozers, and in eight months to a year, you got a golf course. Uh, Willie Parks was a traditionalist, and the guy who followed him, we'll see on the next slide, was also a traditionalist. Uh, Fred Finley came in, so Willie Parks, he actually died, yeah, died in 1925. Constru construction kind of came to a stop because they didn't have a lot of direction and there wasn't Willie Parks to, to direct the building. Uh, but these, these Scottish architects believed that you took what was given to you. You built a course that followed the land. You didn't bring bulldozers in and move the land. Uh, and today you'll see 100 courses in Florida, which are beautiful courses, but they're all bulldozer built. Uh, that's not that's not what Boonesbury is, and that's not what these gentlemen set out to do. Uh, it took a while to get back on track. In 1927, uh, Mr. Finley moved to Virginia, and uh, and Rick will tell us about that. But he moved from Australia. He was a Scotsman when he moved to Australia, built courses in Australia, uh, and later in life moved to Virginia. Do you want to talk for a second about that? Uh, yeah, he's an interesting guy, uh, also from Scotland, of course, Montrose, which is just west of uh, St. Andrews. Uh, he was a family of eight. He uh, was an excellent golfer at a young age, and he went into the military at age 14, like his father, and he was in the military for 21 years. When he retired, he moved to Australia because his wife, his uh, daughter was there. And uh, his son was ill with something we really don't know. They thought maybe moving to Australia, he'd, he'd get better, warmer climate. Uh, in any case, he down there was a professional greenskeeper, uh, club maker, and golf course designer in uh, Australia. At that point in time, 1900, these professionals were everything. They were players, pros, designed the courses, took care of the courses, and uh, made the clubs for that everybody played with. So he stayed there for a while. His son died, unfortunately. And his wife and took the son uh, back to Scotland to be buried. Fred and his daughter, who married an American named Raymond Loving, who you'll hear about a little later, uh, moved to the United States, and I had 1922. It was close <laughs> In that era. Okay. And they, they settled in Virginia. And he went to work with his brother, Alex, who was about seven years older, and who was already been here since the late uh, 1890s. And he was building courses all up and down the East Coast and in the Northeast. So Fred worked with his brother for a while, and then went out on his own and ended up in Virginia with Farmington and Boonesboro at about the same time. So 
So, so Fred did about 36 courses in Virginia, and as you see here, did Farmington, and also did, I believe, a river course in a country called Virginia. Uh, interestingly, he lived at Farmington uh, until his dying day. He lived on the course at Farmington. Um, and of course, he thought that was his favorite design. Wonder why. Uh, <laughs> Boonesboro was finally ready to be open on June 1st of 1929. Uh, there's a video you can also find online of people playing golf uh, at the course in 1934. Uh, it's, it, I get a chuckle out of it. When they were playing golf, there were very few big trees because a lot of them had never been there because they were meadows or had been taken down in the building of the golf course. We have the discussion today at the golf course every fall, every year, don't cut down that tree. <laughs> Well, that tree wasn't in the original plan for the golf course. It never intended. It grew over the last hundred years. Um, but people don't cut down that tree. Uh, it goes back and forth. Uh, building a golf course, a recreational environment, uh, and opening on four months before the stock market crash in 1929 was maybe not the best timing on the, on the planet. Um, and the, Oak, uh, Boonesboro had a hard time like Oakwood did, like, like a lot of Lynchburg did. Lynchburg was very lucky. The banks never closed during the Great Depression. Uh, Boonesboro never closed. Oakwood never closed. But it was very hard. Imagine going to a new member that's having trouble feeding his family and saying, how about a golf membership? Uh, <laughs> not likely to happen for, for most people. Boonesboro is very fortunate to have a, a solid base of members that were not going to give up on the club. And they carried the club for a long time. If you think about it, the recession, 1929, through to almost into World War II. And then World War II comes along. It's not fashionable when your friends are out getting shot at to say, I'm going to go play a round of golf. So World War II is not good for country clubs in general either. So we had about a 15-year period where um, the club survived. It kept going. But we didn't build a lot of things. We didn't do a lot of things new. Uh, and. Uh, and it was, it was not an area you were going to brag about what you did at the country club. So, important things. There would be a time when we brag about things about, that we've done, though. Um, as World War II ended, we started golf tournaments, our, our first recorded golf tournaments that was up on the walls of the club started in 1948. And I think it's fascinating that women's golf and men's golf both being tracked at the same time. The first club tournaments, 1948, we have women's and men's golf, um, which is wonderful. People started to realize we want to be a little bit more like Oakwood. We want, we want a pool, we want tennis. We don't want to be just a golf club. It's heresy to some of our golfers. But, um, but in the early 50s, we built two courts. They were up where the putting green is today, adjacent to the, to the men's locker room. Um, that was not ideal, but that was the land that was available at the time. Uh, later on in 1992, uh, more courts were added. Those two courts were actually, I believe, eliminated at that time. And the courts were added down below where they are today for outdoor courts. Um, in, in, uh, in trying to keep up with the trends in tennis, we needed an indoor facility. And that facility was uh, started in 2008 and finished in 2011. And uh, it, it is tennis goes should be the pride of Central Virginia. It's a, it's a wonderful facility. Um, and it's, it's, done a, it's done a world for Boonesboro tennis. Uh, tennis isn't the only thing we do. Our rap, uh, pickleball has caught on like crazy. Um, and, uh, and, and I laugh too, but, but it really has. People really enjoy it. Especially as you get older, you don't have to chase the ball down as far. Um, I wouldn't say it's easier on the knees, but whatever. Um, but we've invested in pickleball. And you'll notice uh, we have a pro program that's starting next year in our first year of the next century. We've actually begun it a little early, but we're going to undertake improvements to the, to the main indoor tennis facility that will make it a, a, a lot more fun and a lot easier to use. And we're going to build dedicated pickleball courts adjacent to the, the facility that will be, uh, I don't know when they'll be open, but but really are, are aimed at expanding what we can offer folks at the club. Uh, oh, before we move yeah. on, I would like to mention Drew Robinson. Yeah. I think Drew, Drew, Drew. Even you, know, you may be well, saying Drew, Drew. Well, basically, yeah. I, he has been 
uh, fabulous pro uh, at uh, Boonesboro. And my daughter played tennis and it really had a ball out there. And I think last year he had, uh, in the high schools around the area, he had five or six of the number one players uh, in high school that he taught. Uh, number one at each of their different schools, which is pretty good. He's, he's, he's an amazing great. person. He's been with us over 30 years. Yeah. Um, and he really is the heart of the Boonsbury Tennis Program. And uh, uh, and he lives and breathes in that. I mean, he's really synonymous with tennis in Lynchburg. He was elected to the Tennis Hall of Fame as well. So here, uh, I think we've got a slide that we'll have a picture of him for you. Yeah. And some of the things that he's done. Uh, but tennis was a, was a big ad. Uh, in 1964, we added the swimming pool with the snack bar. Blue Marlins, our swim team, we compete against Oakwood, Peakland, four or five other swim teams in the area. Uh, it's a great place, if you think about it today, people don't go to the, to the lake to learn to swim. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things, where do you learn to swim? It's, it's a big feature. Um, moms like to take their kids to the pool. It's a, it's a great recreation. We do parties by the pool. The pool has been a, a, a real asset, and it makes us a, a true country club as opposed to a golf club. Uh, when they put the pool in, I believe I was told, and, and Rick, you know better than me, we had to rearrange the golf course a little bit, but maybe not. I don't, I don't, I didn't not think so that. much. Is that the first pool, 64? That, that was was my, the first pool? That's my understanding, but I don't know. No. There might have been a smaller one. Yeah, there might have been a smaller one that didn't include the, yeah. the lanes to the right. Yeah, I think yeah. right. I think you're right. The, the, the first pool, I believe, was put in 64. That just isn't a picture of it. That's a picture of today's pool. No, Mr. James, I say no. So we went swimming there when we were 10 years old. Yeah. And that was in the 1950s. In the 50s? Yeah. Well, I've got to go back and, and, and read what people have written for me. Because that means I that means I got it wrong. I knew this would happen today. <laughs> Chances of getting it right off is zero. <clears throat> I'm going I'm going to hand off to our to our golf pro, to, our golf, to talk about uh, why Boonesboro golf is uh, is interesting and important in the in the world of golf in Virginia. This guy and the point. You might need to that thing. Okay, well I, I can stand here. Yeah. Evening. Appreciate y'all coming. We've covered some of the things that uh, I was going to talk about a little earlier, but since we have this slide up here, this um, was given to Boonesboro Country Club uh, by the Virginia State Golf Association for a couple of reasons. One is they have supported golf in Virginia since the 40s. Uh, we've had probably 25, 30, or maybe more. Virginia State Golf Association tournaments. Three state amateurs, the last one was just this year. And, and many others, we had state opens, many other tournaments related to uh, golf in Virginia and through the VSGA. Also, Boonesboro has given uh, the VSGA five presidents, and uh, they're listed here. H.M. Bunny Blankenship, 1959, Charlie Hancock, 1969, Ed Key in 1980, excuse me, 81, Marvin Denny Giles in 89, and Grant Key in 2003. Uh, since the Virginia State Golf Association was formed in 1904, Grant and Ed are the only father-son <laughs> group uh, presidents of the VSGA. Uh, so that was a nice uh, thing we have out there on the first tee. We've covered old Fred Finley. And Boonesboro itself uh, is a championship golf course. We've had several architects come by and help and do this and do that. And all of them deemed it a championship course. And it is. It's, it's uh, challenging but fun to play. Uh, it's difficult enough to make you really, really think. Uh, the greens are, are tough, uh, but it's really enjoyable. You'll go, a lot of people that play golf will go play somewhere else, but they always enjoy coming back to Boonesboro and play. And I really enjoyed it. Actually, when I just trying to decide where to set up practice, one of my 
goals was to find a really nice golf course. So this made Boothburg played a big, a big part of me uh, coming to Lynchburg, along with the, the medical community, which was, which was great back in 1979. So uh, I appreciate uh, the, all of that. So, yeah. Well, what's the next? Five presidents. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all right, well, I'll tell you, one of the terms we have at Boonesboro is called the fox boots. Now, that's the fox. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bunny Blankenship, he was executive director of the VSGA probably for, and ran all the terms for probably eight or two, six or eight years before he was president. Give me the next one. That's Charlie. That's the puss. Uh, Charlie Hancock. Uh, president Emeritus of Boonesboro and VSGA President in 19, well it says here 67 to 70, maybe, he, maybe Charlie was re-elected a couple of times. But a great guy, and those two fellows were stalwarts obviously in the Virginia State Golf Association. It's one reason we started the tournament and uh, it's still going strong today, 50 years later. Yeah, that's Grant, the younger kid that was the president. Grant's uh, still here in town, doing well. Can't play golf anymore, his back's bad. Ed is pro. Well, and of course, you all know Benny. That's all right. Um, president in 89. Uh, and I'll get to the, uh, the general golfers in a minute. But my feeling is that Benny was probably the best amateur career amateur since Bobby Jones. One other guy uh, may rival him, and that was a guy named Bill Campbell, who was from West Virginia, and a wonderful golfer and a uh, gentleman. But Vinny uh, is right up there with Bobby Jones and all the legends you hear about uh, in golf, in particular amateur golf. Boy, yeah, that's Ed Key, uh, president, but he was also president of Boonesboro. Okay. Then you can't get away from me. <laughs> okay. Let me let me move on uh, to uh, the golfers now. And the golf well the golf course again. Fred Finley as uh, Alex described. The Scottish architects used the lay of the land. They didn't use have they didn't have any bulldozers back then. They had uh, just uh, horses, mules. But uh, Fred Finley never used a blueprint. He just walked the course and decided what to do with it. Uh, and his, uh, he used the routing of uh, parts, but the golf course is his, for, for sure. A lot of Scottish and English uh, affects to the course, particularly around the greens, that are great. So you want to, want to touch on that or we'll say that? Yeah. No, I want to. I want to go back to Ben okay, real good. quick. We'll start there. Yeah. I'll go down to the list. Um, Benny, as you know, as I mentioned, is a wonderful golfer. We've got some of the stuff here. He uh, won the Virginia State Amateur <coughs> seven times. Um, won the State Open four times, and he would have won it five times, but he missed a three-foot putt on the last hole, so I could win. <laughs> so I've never seen him miss a putt like that before. So maybe he was being nice. Uh, he was on the Walker Cup team five times. If y'all wa anybody watched the Ryder Cup, which was in Rome recently, about a month ago, uh, this is the amateur version of the Ryder Cup. Uh, they've chosen to go play the England and Ireland uh, amateur players every two to three years. So he did it five times uh, and was captain once. He um, won the National Amateur in 1972, the British Amateur in 75, played in the Masters nine times as an amateur. Um, really, really an unbelievable record. He's won so many state and regional tournaments we couldn't list him. You know, it would, be, it would take forever to do it. But needless to say, uh, I was lucky enough to play with him and against him some. And actually, actually all the people I talk about, I played with uh, at least once. Okay, move on to Don. Right. 
Oh, also, Vinny, I would say, is an ultimate competitor. He was never out of a hole. He, could, he had a pro-level short game, meaning if he messed up, he could fix it. Somehow, he could do it. Unbelievable. Now, Don, I watched grow up and play golf. Don was a great athlete and wonderful, wonderful girl. She was, a, a, another word for her in Virginia golf should be dominant. When she started playing in Virginia State tournaments at about 16, she won every tournament she played in for about seven years straight, from 83 to 89. She won two state juniors, 83, 84, and then won the state amateur five years in a row. So she never lost a match against another person for, for five or six years, which is unbelievable. She went on then to uh, go to Carolina, All-American there, and turned pro, and won six tournaments on the ladies professional tour, one major. And uh, of course, the Donna is a golf tournament at Boonesboro in her honor uh, that we have uh, <clears throat> several divisions, young, young girls, uh, you know, young adults, and then the senior division. And it's really taken on. If you really like golf and like to watch women's golf, which I do now rather than the men, I don't have anything in common with those guys. <laughs> uh, I, I love to watch these girls play. It's, they're fabulous. Uh, and uh, Donna is uh, doing well. She comes back uh, to the tournament. She lives now in Pinehurst and is a teaching pro at uh, Pine Needles. And she was a great athlete in high school. She was a really good basketball player. Tremendous basketball player. Okay, who's next? That's it. I've got a couple of others I want to go over. Uh, yeah. Jimmy Watts. James O. Watts. Jimmy won the state amateur in 1939, was runner up in 32, won the state senior in 74, runner up in 82. And when they had the first state amateur at Boonesboro in 47, they had a 47, 99, and 2023. Jimmy was a medalist, meaning he had the low score for 36 holes, then you go to match play one-on-one -on -one like a tennis term. So he was a wonderful golfer, but, and I would say, a fiery competitor. No club in Jimmy's bag was safe if he hit a bad shot. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it, could, it could end up anywhere, over his knee, <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> but he, uh, I even played with him in the club championship here, and he was, in the mid 70s or maybe a little above. He shot his age that day from the, from the regular tees. It was unbelievable. Um, let's see, I don't have the same quiet order you do. But also, another thing I think it's important to note, uh, Jimmy lived in Jefferson's Poplar Forest from July of 1946 to November of uh, 1980, and Jimmy's daughter, Key, married Vinnie Jobs, so the circle continues. Uh, George Gosey, uh, state amateur champion in 52, runner-up in 53. The only guy, I played with him one time, but he was really nice. I don't remember much about it, but he's the only guy I heard that when he got in a sand trap, he would have the caddy tend the pin, so he thought he would knock it in every time from out of a sand trap. It's true, yeah, he was fabulous. We got uh, Ed, the Judge Ed Eddings. Now, I'm sure most of you have known Judge over the years. I was just talking to Aubrey about him. Everybody got stories about Judge. He was the state senior champion in 1965. A real character, a witty uh, competitor and a wonderful guy. He may have been a better gin player than he was a golfer, but that's hard to believe. So, uh, I guess we'd have to ask uh, Jimmy Forehand uh, <laughs> at this point. But I always enjoyed playing with Judge Evans. Now, Jimmy Alexander, who still played some golf, won the state senior in 1993, dead straight 
hitter. He never made a mistake. It was really hard to beat. Uh, and uh, he and I hit that many times and messed me up a lot, I'm sure, when we played. He was just uh, tough to beat. And there's a couple of Danville uh, transfers, John Bruce and myself. John, uh, who um, is here now, we've both been here over four, well over 40 years. John won the State Open uh, in 1974, 75, 76, and 77 as an amateur. And he's playing against all the pros in the state, which is pretty unbelievable. Uh, so he is still playing some, and we get together a little bit. Ned Baber uh, won the state amateur in 1960, and uh, Jane White, of course, his, uh, his sister. All in all, a lot of wonderful golfers uh, at Boonesboro that I played with, seen, enjoyed, and uh, really brought uh, the, the level of golf up uh, at the club over the years. I've enjoyed it. Boonesboro's been a respite. It's sort of a sanctuary for me from a busy work schedule. I'm sure it has been for a lot of people. And uh, I hope I continue to enjoy it for many years. <laughs> Thank you. Didn't want, didn't want to be remiss. In, in looking at this, uh, I didn't realize how good a golfer Donna Andrews' mother was. And her father, father, father was runner up in the state act. <clears throat> Helen, her mother, won the, the club championship uh, six times between 1989 and 2008. So it wasn't like uh, Donna didn't, uh, didn't have some coaching at home. Uh, and the picture of Helen and Donna. And <coughs> Becky Hawkins is the other person that Rick mentioned who's won the club championship seven times. Great callers. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, we. We talk, but the golf course at Boonesboro really is almost exactly the same as it was in 1929. We have one new hole, the tenth hole, we moved because a road goes through the golf course and cars kept getting whacked. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's the only hole that really changed dramatically. We've done a few greens, we've done a couple of greens, but um, not not a drastic change at all. So the course is basically similar to what it was in 1929, which is unusual. Dan, I will call on you. Sure. Okay. All right. You want this guy? I'll just slide it. Okay. So it's hard to follow up on all that history here, so I'm, I'm just a newbie here now. So. <laughs> i got to take it forever. I know. <laughs> the, um, no, it's, it's really, it's fascinating when you know, I first came here, it was really easy to see, you know, the history of the club and the, the sense of <coughs> the commitment to the club from all the members. And um, I really felt it was just a great opportunity, you know, the club was just at that point where it was ready to take that next step. And, you know, I think it was always looking for that way to tie to the history of the club while improving it for the future a little bit. So we've, um, in the last four years, we've done a lot of things. We've you know, had some recognitions around the golf course and some other things. You know, the, the original home is still, you know, our motto has been welcome to our house, and still <coughs> is, we use that, because that's the feel that's coming into the house, and we want that feeling of hospitality, of southern hospitality coming to the club. So a lot of the rooms have that feel, it's broken up, and while we have some of the large rooms, the ballroom, and we've made some other additions, which we'll get to, um, we still keep that feeling of coming to the house. Uh, this is the ballroom. It's, you know, it was, you know, as the vision says in the 20s, uh, very warm and light. It turns over. It's been amazing to me to see that turnover from, you know, a ceremony for a wedding to a, a actual wedding to uh, wine dinners to celebrations, Halloween events. It's just, you know, there's a lot that goes on. This room constantly changes. Um, you see some beautiful weddings and decorations around this room. Um, so that, again, it's uh, just a beautiful space that leads back up to the main part of the house. Um, the green room is one of the, the lounge, some call it, and it's just off the ballroom. And again, it's a great little private area, has its own bar and fireplace, um, and ties into our new outdoor dining space we have. Here's some of the uh, some of the longer term members of Malcolm Jefferson, who's synonymous with the club dining and how he took care of the members around there. 
Um, and when we redid the restaurant, um, which was the Malcolm Jefferson Grill, we kind of refreshed it, made it brighter, and we uh, rebranded as MJ's. So we kind of kept that, you know, feeling again to the past. And so now it's MJ's Grill. It's a little, uh, little brighter and a little fun. But it's uh, still trying. And this is the new space um, where it's done up there. And, you know, as an example of the um, of the trying to stick to it, you can see around the front of the bar in this back room. There was a, a large oak tree that was in front of the club. It was a 160-year-old oak tree. <coughs> Unfortunately, one came, came out and the thing was really leaning, and we're going, oh, this is not good. So we had to take down that tree, uh, which was iconic. Um, it was a shame to lose it, but it was a safety issue. But we were able to actually mill the wood um, in a short amount of time, to get that kiln dried, and then used it for the front of the bar and in that back sitting area. So again, it was kind of keeping that history of the club. Everybody knew the the large white oak tree, and we kind of blended it back into the improvements of the club there. And this is that sitting area and all that beautiful white oak that was used uh, from the tree. Mm -hmm. So again, it's really opened it up and refreshed the space. And my understanding was this was down below, this was the kitchen in the original house, so that's where they usually would be. We added some wine lockers. We have a wine program now for our members, so they can you know, have a locker, and then they're, as part of being part of the wine program, we have a private little uh, room there where they can have little miniature wine dinners and things, and that's been a great addition uh, for that current to have a wait list for some wine lockers. Uh, we added an outdoor fire pit. Again, the, you know, the big trend, people, everyone loving to be outdoors, and you know, the views are incredible around there, so it's just it made a lot of sense to take advantage of all of those uh, views and add this Many, and I think one of the things when I first came to the club, I talked to the board about creating social spaces. So more spaces where couples and families could gather and have conversations and have fun. So this is one of the first uh, projects we took on around the club, was creating that space. Uh, full pro shop has all kinds of uh, merchandise uh, for the members and some new carts, uh, golf carts with lithium batteries. So again, we're continually improving with the times as technology and other things. Uh, we added a 21, we added a little fitness center. This actually used to be part of the men's <coughs> locker room. We kind of took that out with an excess of amount of lockers and reconfigured it, put it in a little space. And again, just the trends of today, fitness and wellness, and um, we run some programs around that as well. So it's been so we refreshed the locker room areas and the, the little men's real dining area we had. Um, interesting when we started that, it was just a, a low stained ceiling in there and we kind of took down the first piece and we're like, wow, look at this, it looks like the ballroom. So we had to move some duct work and some electrical and pipes and all that, but it really turned out fantastic. And again, just kind of bringing it up, you know, modernizing it a little bit. Um, the recent addition this year, we opened up our outdoor bar and grill area and since it was our centennial year, we appropriately named it 1923, or is it to be called, called 23. So that's been a really great addition. This is just off the fire pit and just off the ballroom to the left. The pool is to the right. So it's a really great central location where, where people will gather and just, you know, have a, a picture of President Charlie Evans for the ribbon cutting earlier this spring. So that's been a great addition to the club as well. Um, so we're in the process of putting some heaters so we can extend the season there outdoors. Um, you know, all kinds of events. They, they, just had our 100th anniversary gala celebration. Uh, you can see some of the pictures there. We had a champagne dress to welcome everyone coming in, and aerial bartenders, and we had a great band, and lots of good food. Chef, uh, this chef has been with us for almost 25 years. Chef Andre Ellis does an amazing job with the food. So there's really some great talent around the club. You know, we mentioned we talked about Drew Robbins or our lawyer. Um, you know, we've really blended some new, younger talent with some of the ones that have been there, and really created a great energy with events and fun things that are happening at the club there as we you know, look ahead to the next hundred years there at the club. So that's pretty much what I have. So Alex, you want to wrap things up? You sure. guys have done an amazing job with the history and like I said, I'm just so, kind of here. One of the things that when I first got involved with, um, with working with Dan and the board, um, I thought we ran a golf course in a country club. I had, I had no clue what that meant. Dan runs the second largest golf shop in Central Virginia, so I went to Dick's. He runs an amazing tennis program, but also a tennis shop. He runs three restaurants, not one, three restaurants, and a catering service for weddings. He runs a venue uh, and a tennis program. You know, it's, it's amazing the scope of the business 
isn't so much a huge business, but it's the scope of the business. There are a lot of different moving parts. And, and we have to give, I have to give Dan a lot of credit for, yes. for keeping all the balls up in the air, because it's been amazing to watch. I have a lot of great members, so that makes it easy. <laughs> <laughs> but we're excited about what comes next. Uh, we've been really fortunate uh, to have great members carry us through the hard times. Uh, we've had really good leadership. We saw a slide, two slides back, Charlie Evans, our current president, um, you know, pushed through and, and got 1923 built with Dan. Um, it, it, it's just, it's a game changer for us. Uh, and we really look forward to other things like that. We're actually starting our next phase of improvements. We're in the process of redoing the bunkers on all of the courses with a new uh, better Billy bunker system. So that'll be in the work starting in November this year. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier, we'll be adding some dedicated outdoor pickle uh, ball courts and refreshing the long driveway into the club and a few other projects we have going to indoor tennis lighting and some other things. So we're continually looking ahead to how we can keep continuing to raise and elevate the club both from services and quality and facilities and the offerings to our members. So yeah, it's a great, great place. Thanks so much for letting us come out and talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Changed in many ways, and that's one. Also, I'm not sure Key wanted him to turn pro. That's uh, the real reason. And that might be the real reason. But that is the real you know, reason. <laughs> <laughs> then he went on. He went to Georgia, all American Dad. Then went to um, Virginia Law. Graduated there in '69, and was a sports representative. Not for just golfers. He had other sports too that he, uh, he represented. But um, it was right in that transition period. Uh, I was after Vinny, and um, uh, you know, if you were as good as Vinny, you know, four years later, five years later, yeah, eight years later, it would have been different maybe, but he made the right decision. He, he's planted himself in golf history in the United States for sure. Also in the nature, there's a book there with some pictures from oh, the yeah. box plus. There's a, actually a picture of Dr. Bendall in 1979. He's hardly changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> some information on the, uh, the club that was in Virginia Golf, where we've been featured recently in there a couple times. Uh, they featured Hole 17 as one of the best holes in uh, Virginia Golf and some other articles. So again, it's a, an amazing history. And I, I believe the five presidents was the most of any Virginia club, is that correct? Uh, and maybe, I didn't oh, love the country club with Virginia Mayor, but that, at that point in time, it was. So it may be different now. Yeah. That's, you know, 20 years ago. So. We're due for another Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. And um, just a reminder that our next lecture is November 15th with Peyton Young. Peyton is a young uh, PhD candidate, and she has done some work at Patrick Henry's Red Hill Plantation. So we have an amazing lecture with her about Black American life at Patrick Henry's Red Hill Plantation, November 15th. Hope you'll join us. Thank you so much. Thank you.